on. You wouldn't be trending on the internet if, if you were 45 and looking like the other 45 <laughs> year olds. <laughs> I'm telling you, I had a friend that, that went, I'm like, go to this sheikh and listen to his lecture. And he went, he's like, I couldn't, I couldn't listen to him. I said, why? He said, he had a belly. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I just, I couldn't find myself taking advice for someone that can't keep his health in check. Like that, that much of the ego he doesn't have in check, which is unfair to some people because they have some medical conditions and they're definitely overweight, you know, saints, I believe, you know, it's not necessary that you're, because some people just don't have the knowledge. So they eat like they used to eat and the food, the quality isn't the same. It's not what it used to be, right? Yeah, and honestly, I think, I think some people are just so focused on their craft mm. where working out and stuff is just not on, on the list at all. And I think that's fair. I think like people like Mark Zuckerberg, for you to say, well, before he started jujitsu, yeah, for you to be like, say, oh, I don't want to listen to him yeah. <laughs> about business because look, look how you know unfit he is. It's like, all right, well, he's been doing other things as well. I think the fitness thing's a little overrated. It was not overrated. Sorry. I think it's gotten too far with the social media age, especially mm. in the last two, three years, how far people have gone with it. It's like, oh, I only respect you if you lift weights or I only respect you if you look this this way or this way. I'm like, ah, this it's isn't... It's a bit much. It's a bit much. Yeah. It's a bit much. There's but some old people that you should learn from too. Is that an issue? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as you age, and you, you know, it's hard to always <laughs> age gracefully. But, um, you know, I think a balance, for what, what did someone once tell me? He said, take deen gently, right? That a little bit that is consistent is better than a lot of action. That, you know, you do it sometimes, you don't do it some other time. So praying two rakahs after your isha as your qiyam layl before you go to sleep to ensure you get qiyam layl every single night is a wise thing to do um, until you're capable of praying your tahajjud every single night, which is another source. Look, look, look what, what did you say? You said, I have to have my coffee because if I don't have my coffee, I can't function. And to some degree, it's not because coffee in and of itself benefits you in that way. It is coffee is just a veil for God's command. See, this is the breakthrough understanding. Are we really, are we set now? I think we've hit the. <laughs> you were good. I think the the biggest um, challenge we have today, as duat people that are inviting people, preaching, calling people towards Allah, and scholars, is to clearly explain and define the role of asbab in your life, the means that you utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the tools with which you perceive the world or the tool with which you perceive the world, many people have a misunderstanding of the word qalb. They think qalb means the heart, or some will even tell you it's not the, the heart that pumps blood, it's the spiritual heart. But really when Allah talks about you know, qalb in the Quran, it's the thing that switches between thoughts from one thought to another, from one idea to it's actually the mind. It's actually the aql. And liqawmin yaqilun is often mentioned in the Quran. So the first thing we have to realize is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us what our purpose of life is, but then told us the medium of the exam. He says that I created this human being. Inna khalaqna al insana min nutfatin amshajin nabtalihi. We created him to test him. So we created him to test him. Immediately, he says, so in order to test him, we gave him the ability to hear and the ability to see. So the medium, the platform where the test is taking place is mind, its perception. But that tool has limitations. I think it's interesting what you're saying. Uh, if you don't mind me commenting Please, on Bismillah. it. Yeah, so there's an academic paper by Professor Muhammad Omar Salim. He states that in the past, scientists thought that the brain uh, was responsible for our experiences of love, passion, and other emotional sensations. 
but then recent studies have explored the heart communicates with the brain in ways that significantly affect how we perceive and react to the world. It was found that the heart seemed to have its own logic that frequently diverged from the direction of the brain. So they did a, 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 they say after extensive research, researchers discovered that the heart has its own complex nervous system, that it's sophisticated enough to qualify as a little brain in its own right. The heart has a network of neurons, neurotransmitters, proteins, and support cells similar to those of the ones in the brain. Its elaborate circuitry enables it to act independently of the cranial brain to learn, remember, and even feel and sense. Mushroom. The heart's nervous system contains about 40,000 neurons called sensory neurites. Thus, it was revealed, finally, right, that the heart has its own intrinsic nervous system that operates and processes information independently of the brain or nervous system. I found this incredible when, when I discovered yeah, this piece of research. I recently bumped into this as well um, by a non-Muslim who was saying that there are just these like thinking like cells uh, in the heart. And that's the thing with science is that it's always advancing and we're learning new and new, th new things. But we have to distinguish between the brain and the mind. So brain is something you can open the head and touch. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you doing so, but it's something you can do. Um, while the mind is not something palpable. So it's not something you can necessarily touch, but it's something you, can, you, you see the effects of. So when I say mind, I mean seeing perception, thoughts, um, and feelings. All that falls under the umbrella of mind. So I like okay. to think the, the, the analogy that you, you'll find online, like I, I didn't come up with this, but it, it helps really elucidate the point, is that the, the ruh is placed over the, the mind is almost like the virtual reality headset that's placed on top of the ruh so that you know when you see or because seeing is really through the ruh how do we know this it's a different between you know you know the eye itself and vision itself or basar um the the when you're alive and you have the ruh in you and I say can you see me can you hear me you say yes if the angel of death were to come and take away your soul the same eyes are there the same ears are there but if I'm talking to the body itself I'm like can you see it that there's no response so something left it seems the body after death the ruh which we call amrullah it's God's command so you only see through God's command. You only hear through God's command because when the command's removed, you no longer see and hear. The secret is the ruh. But you think of the mind as the tools of perception. That's, that's the divine matrix that's placed on top of the ruh to make infinity appear as space and eternity feel like time. And it's... The example you can give is, it, it's like if you give someone purple tinted glasses and you tell them to look at snow, they'll see the snow tinted purple. So you see the world in accordance with the limitation of the tool of perception itself. So God limited, because he says, I remove from you the cover, I remove the veil after death. So the veil is this mind so that what you're seeing and what you're hearing, like Allah says in the Quran, is the test. So you can think of your experience in the world as just these vibrational energy, so to speak, where God is downloading content into your life. That's a very different outlook on the world or the way, a way to perceive the world than to see it as separate from you. Like God is just an item on your list. And then you don't really get, like I was watching Muhammad Hijab yesterday on Strike It Big, and where he was, you know, talking about the argument from contingency and, and the proof of God. And, but you could tell that the hosts were having difficulty understanding some of the concepts because the foundation wasn't put in place. That as Muslims, we believe everything is a manifestation of God's actions and attributes and rulings. So everything is a function of God's attributes or actions and the entire universe, this divine matrix, whatever's downloaded into your consciousness from the cloud, so to speak, that software aspect of it is from God. But why? Allah says, to test them. 
to test them. So now wait, you're going, wait a second. So what I'm seeing and this world is not outside of me? No, it's not. It's, it's not <laughs> at all. It's actually downloaded within you as a scenario through this mind, through perception. And God wants to see how you're going to react. And we share the same sort of uh, downloadable center, so to speak, from God. These, the consciousness sort of interlaps from time to time as you interact with different people. It's the same reality, but different people are being exposed to different parts of it. So now that you see the world this way, you understand the first lesson is the qudra of Allah, the power of Allah, is not borrowed by the created phenomena. The qudra of Allah stays qudratullahi fi dhati. It's, it's God's. It belongs to God. And God just, he's the one doing everything, but he put this screen called worldly phenomena, where when you view you see and you think that things are coming from things like rain is coming from clouds. These are light is coming from the sun. These are regular associations of things that Allah placed in these things, but they are not executing anything. The one that's doing everything is Allah, but these are just veils. They're just curtains. And an example I typically give is the example of the two best friends who one of them decides to get married and invites his not so intelligent friend over for, for food. And his not so bright friend can smell all this great food, but he doesn't see anything and he sees this curtain and all of a sudden he sees food being pushed through the curtain. And he's thinking that the curtain is producing, and he goes to his friend, he says, where'd you get this magic curtain? And he goes from this place. And so he rushes, he leaves him, he goes, buys the same curtain, he puts it up in his home, he invites all his friends over for food, and he's just like, wait, and, 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 and they're all sitting there, but they can't smell anything, and it's taking time, and they're like, where's, where's the food? He says, no, no, this is a magic curtain, just give it some time, and it'll tr begin to produce all this food, and they said, no, 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 <laughs> he said, oh man, you, you didn't get it, when you were visiting your friend, he just got married, and there was his wife behind the curtains, producing preparing the food and pushing it through the curtain so all of worldly phenomena all the means money you know time all of it they're just curtains they're veils and behind it so to speak is the qudra of allah he's the one operating he's the one doing this is the meaning of ashhadu an la ilaha that first part of the why is it negation first because you're going to see something different with your eyes. You're going to see light coming from the sun and rain coming from the clouds. And God's saying, whatever you tashhad, he says, you first begin by negating what you see. Illallah. And affirming that God is the doer. This is called tawheed al-rububiyya. It's not tawheed al-uluhiyya where we're turning back to God for everything. But this is understanding that Allah is the operator, the director, the executor, the manager of all affairs, that simply just, you know, like a, uh, the puppeteer that is controlling the puppet, so to speak, but you don't see these hidden strings. The child is fascinated with the story and the tale, but the parents, they know what's happening behind the scene. This is why Allah opens up his book with ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The first condition is to believe in an unseen system of gods. Allah says about the kuffar, he says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They're only aware of the outwardly manifest of this world. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ Akhira here is judgment day, but also kind of like what's behind the scenes. And this is why when you die, Allah says, فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حديد. We removed from you your veil. So now your, your vision is like hadid from hidda. It's very sharp, but it could also refer to why iron? The only element that was brought down, Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ So it's from out of this world. So Allah, it's like Allah saying that you, you will begin to see things that are not from this world. So Allah simply fine-tunes the mind in a way 
where now you enter another dimension called Barzakh, and that dimension has different rules associated with it. Because Allah says for the Day of Judgment, He says, يَوْمَ نُبَدِّلُ الْأَرْضَ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ He says, we replace you know, this planet, Al-Ard, with a different one. Because how, come, how can the sun be so close to us and we not die? We're just like you know, sweating and, and, and we're just it's profusely hot. Because the rules and the dynamics change, but the one behind it all, he's the one that doesn't change. This, I would say, almost revolutionary way of explaining how the world actually works will completely shake the grounds of shirk and subtle shirk, especially from underneath anybody. So now you're just khalas, you're... And this is why if you think about it, when you're in the world of souls, Allah says, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? There's only one answer, indeed you are. Lord is the one the managing affairs, sustaining you, taking care of everything, doing everything. And then you come in this world and you see other than that doing, other than God doing with your... And then Allah says, the test is when you enter your grave, I'm going to ask you the same question, but instead of, am I not your Lord? Who was your Lord? Man Rabbuka? Because now you could answer one of two ways. You either know who your God is or your Rabb is or you don't based on how you live this life. Tawheed is the encryption key to the matrix. It's the password that unlocks the divine matrix and then you begin to realize. It's like a lucid dream. It's like when you wake up in your dream and you're like, oh, I'm dreaming. So all of a sudden, now that you know you're in dreaming, you have I can fly. So I'm just going to fly because I know that I'm dreaming. And all of a sudden, I unlock these powers that I didn't have before. But these powers aren't like you're, you know, a wand that you're going to, you know, physically. Ignorance means ignoring the truth. The truth is one. So when you're ignorant, it's the opposite of knowledge, ilm. And Allah, ilm here, awareness, fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah. That is the key to seeing that Allah is the one who's in full control. Now, when Allah asks you, who's your Lord? And you could answer either Rabbi Allah or otherwise. If you lived your life in accordance with this encryption key, which the other part of is Muhammadun Rasulullah. So you play by the rules of the game in the matrix. And what a serious game it is because your end abode will be determined based on how you respond to the different scenarios that God downloads into your life, now you have a way of living, a purpose for life that's much richer than I'm just running after wealth or pursuing wealth because I think wealth in and of itself can benefit or harm. Wealth is a tool. Allah, if He wants, can benefit you through it. If He wants, He can harm you through it. He can harm when all the means of benefit are on your side, and He can benefit you when all the means of harm are on your side. He's the nafi' and nafi'. He's abdar. These are two of His attributes through which Allah manifests His doing, His actions. So when this becomes clear, it really it quickly, just uh, changes the way just you look adar, at life. Adar means... Can you tell them what adar means as well? A nafi' and adar you... In English? Yeah, so the, the one that afflicts harm or benefit. And this is another thing that people will ask, like, why does Allah afflict harm? Why, why is there harm? God is good, so why is there evil? That typical question. Well, you can't know things except through their opposites. The question in and of itself has no grounds to stand on. Like, you wouldn't know benefit if Allah, if there wasn't harm. You wouldn't appreciate... Well, you said something profound, that, that God's attributes and mannerisms are manifested in the makeup and the infrastructure and the structure of the universe and our reality. Well, how much harm do you add to your body when you go to the gym and you pump weights? You're literally breaking down your muscles in order to gain benefit, right? Mashallah. So even within the examples, and Allah even says this, in I love right? We, we, we put examples in our examples throughout all of life. Mashallah. There's things that defy the... Fi the the forest needs to burn in order for it to grow, right? When people stopped, remember, you, you remember that time period when America used to stop forest fires on purpose, and then they found the forest dying. And so then they started doing forest fires, like <laughs> engineering I, I, forest fires. I didn't know that, but it makes sense to some degree. 
I, yes, there, there's, it's almost like, why did Allah create fire? Why is there Jahannam? Well, if, if, if you see a fire, you don't walk towards it. You walk away from it. So it's almost like also a manifestation of His mercy. Um, but in order to know paradise, there has to be that other side. So God has both, we call them His Sifatul Jamaliya and Jalaliya and Kamaliya. Sifatul Jalal are the majestic attributes, Al Qawi, Al Muntaqim, the revengeful, the, 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 the strong, right? And then you have the beautiful, you know, traits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Like uh, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. They're, they're, they're gentler, they're softer. But you have both sides of the spectrum. And then you have Al Alim. These are the, the attributes of a perfection, like Al Kamal, the complete ones, right? Because his ilm is not. It has no beginning and end. It's just perfect knowledge. And this one is interesting because I had put up a post that also went viral where I said, um, and you'll find this in the teachings in general. I think Mufti Abdul Rahman mentioned it first from Santa Barbara. I think he's in the UK now, um, where he says um, that destiny is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Because God just knows what you're going to do with the free will he gave you because he's beyond space-time. God can't be within time. He has no beginning. So <laughs> this is, yeah. if he's beyond space and time, he's not controlled by it. He can't be controlled by it. We're within the space-time continuum. So to also just, everything is, subhanAllah, Tawheed, um, Brother Mahmoud, is... It's a it's a perspective that's very you know, liberating. You know, subhanAllah, what you said about space time, one of Stephen Hawking's works, and he died an atheist, mm. but his work proved that space and time are creations that happened with the Big Bang. They are not eternal truths. They are things that came along with the creation of the universe. Therefore, space and time are a creation of Allah, and therefore proof of of what you're saying as well. He, he's the necessary being. So this is, this is called the argument from contingency. Everything needs something to make it the way that it is. But if you keep going back, regressing, until you, you, you need something that doesn't need anything else. This is why there's two names of Allah that if you were to understand and live by and just really intrinsically bring in you, you know, you're really practicing it and understand it, that will bring conviction on all of God's names. And the first one is Al-Qadir, because Allah is Qadir, nothing limits him. He's not incapable of anything, he can do anything. But the problem is for many of us, we say Allah is Qadir, but he needs money to, like we need money to like survive. Like how do you handle that? Allah is Qadir, but yeah, I have to go to work. Like Allah is the Razaq, but I also have to work. Well, yes, you have to work, but for what intention? Not because money benefits or harms you. You work because Allah commanded you to work. But why did he command you, command you to work? Because part of the test is going to be laid out as part of that occupation or whatever you're busy with. And your purpose from doing business as a believer, as a Muslim and a mu'min, is to fulfill God's command that he put into the asbab and the means in your life. So he's like, you're going to have to get married. Here are some rules associated with marriage. You're going to have to work for someone. Here's some labor associated rules, halal and haram. You're going to have to go into business. Here are things you have to be mindful of in business, do's and don'ts. And the believer goes into business, the real means for barakah in your work and in your life and is that you fulfill God's command in the sabab, in the means, in the worldly phenomena. And then you are successful. Get this. This is very important. You are successful irrelevant of the outcome. Because we're not, as Muslims, we're not results oriented. We're command oriented. We don't pursue wealth. We pursue God's commands. It is up to God to decide whether you're gonna make the big bucks or not. Hopefully ask him for afiyah, don't wish for it, don't not wish for it, just say Allah, whatever's better for me, make that you know the case for me. But 
if he's given you the riches, what's the right response? And you can have money and it can be good for you or bad for you. And you cannot have money and it be good for you or bad for you, depending on your relationship and what you do with that money. This core understanding where we change our direction, and, and this was an opening someone had with me recently on WhatsApp. They were asking me, but if this, that, and destiny, and but how come, like, do we choose? Allah's in control of everything, so I don't have to do anything. I said, no, 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 no. Did you ever watch Netflix? Did you ever watch the Black Mirror, the episodes? Black yeah. Mirror? Did you catch the episode where the movie pauses and then it asks you how you want the next scene to proceed? Like, do they drop the cup or not? You get to choose. And then the movie plays based on the choice that you made. This is qada and qadar. God, as part of the test, he said, okay, I'm going to present you with this scenario. You're going to make the choice. Because if there's no choice, why is there heaven and hell? Makes no sense. You're guided, as in part of your guidance is, are you going to make the right decision or the wrong decision? That's your in. That's where you put the effort. What effort? To strive against your ego, your nefs, that ask, acts like a resistor in the circuit. In order for more current to flow through, you want the least resistance as possible in the form of submission to whatever Allah decrees. So I don't care if Allah makes me rich. I just have to fulfill His. But most people get distracted by riches because they're not, you know, they're not really used to or maybe they don't get it. Or So balance is good, but I'm saying be a billionaire. Don't miss your, your Fajr Salah because you're a billionaire and pay your zakah and make sure the source of your money is halal, and don't have yaqeen on the money, and fulfill God's command in the money, and don't let, let it distract you from your other priorities, and you are successful. Exactly those conditions, exactly as I mentioned them. Make sure the source of your risk is halal. Make sure it doesn't distract you from God's you know, uh, pro, you know, uh, commands that take priority to this one, like so, your five times daily salah. Five times daily salah is the five times litmus test. Because every salah, you're busy with something. <laughs> and then it's like, you know, you first get this thought, get up and pray. You think it's your thought, but that's an angelic thought. And that, it's important to distinguish between the voices in your head and the matrix, because the waswas, right? There's also satanic thoughts. It's usually followed by, you got time. And that's like, you know, Iblis doing his part. And then, you know, you're like, okay, I have a little time. And before you're like, oh, and, and then you've missed it. So... Getting those priorities in place, understanding the way the world works, and then learning enough of your knowledge to be able to live a 24-7 life in accordance with prophetic guidance is your purpose in life. You will find happiness. You're not anxious about making wealth or not making wealth. Your focus is the akhirah, and you're good. Otherwise, you're just going to run, 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 run. And then Allah will, you think you, I, I have more money, but you have more expenses too. I have more money, but you don't have time to spend on your children. So everyone has the same pie, but the pie is broken up into different pieces. Allah gives someone money, but no children. Someone no money, really good, healthy body, you know, balance. So the more you have of those, the more sort of the test is and the focus is. And why is your test harder than someone else's? Because your iman may be stronger than someone else's. Well, let me ask you this. Sure. In in one of in the Quran, Allah gives this dramatic scene of the end of times when 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 the earth cracks open and when the sky breaks open and and when the horn is blown. And the first thing he says after and it goes on extensively for for a while with all this imagery of the reality that we're living in completely breaking and falling apart. And basically, as you're saying, the matrix completely breaking and we, we're seeing it live. And Allah says right after it, تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَمَا أَخَرَتْ Right? The soul immediately, out of every lesson it, it could have learned from seeing the scene, the first thought it has, out of every thought, is what did I prioritize? 
and what did I put on the back burner? Marshall. And I, that's why I love what you're saying because it reminds me of those verses that out of everything, we could have thought about my prayer, my, my CM, my, my fasting, but instead we're thinking bigger picture in that moment. What did I prioritize and what did I put on the back burner? And what kind of, when it comes to finances as a Muslim, hmm. where should we put it on our priority list? Because Allah does even indicate in the Quran that money is, you know, a, a reality, right? It's not something fake like some people try to say. If you, if you want to categorize things based off of fake, based off of it being man-made, then most things you could categorize as fake, right? The social constructionist. Everything's a social construct for social constructionists. SubhanAllah. Um, when it comes to money, it's first important to understand how Allah describes it in the Quran. What does Allah say? He says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." So first thing is to establish that it's a test from God. So the minute you have it, you're undergoing an exam. Um, we're still under this delusion that our efforts lead to more or, our, or a decrease in our efforts will mean less money. It's not really the case. There are some people, you know this, there are some people, they wake up the next day, they inherited millions of dollars. And what effort of their own, right? But does this mean that I don't go to school and I, I you know, I, I, I don't study and I don't work and I don't know? Everybody should learn a trade because for in order for this dunya to function, that that's the way it functions. Know something that you can, but with what intention? I'm learning this to earn halal risk so I don't have to ask anybody for anything. I want Allah to suffice me through my own efforts and works. So... That intention is good. You shouldn't seek to be a billionaire or a millionaire. The Prophet Sallallahu said, if, if you wake up having enough you know, food on the table, enough food for the day, and your health is in place, and you've got shelter, you've got everything in this dunya and what it contains. So the Prophet Sallallahu is teaching us that the true riches is in contentment. The only way, Andrew Tate says this, he said it beautifully, he said, um, th there's th there's a difference like between uh, it doesn't occur to me right now maybe if it if it hits me in a bit but money in and of itself is not what I'm after but if I'm after it I'm after it for the right intention is very important so you don't waste any valuable time I'm getting it so that I don't ask anybody for anything to support my family, to put halal food, to avoid the haram out there, to help others, to pay zakah, great noble intentions. But money in and of itself, if you're after it in and of itself, for itself, then your yaqeen is on it. Your yaqeen is on it. You, you really think that it's going to benefit you somehow. You still don't get it. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he tell Musa alayhi salam? He says, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا Musa." He, says, it's, it's, it, he's, he began to describe the benefits of the staff. And then Allah said, toss it. And then it became a snake. And then a snake is harmful. Then Allah says, take it. It doesn't make sense. Both are God's commands. One is drop what you see is beneficial to you. One is take what you deem is harmful to you. Because Allah is trying to teach him, as long as you stick to my command, even when it goes against your logic and reason, then you are successful in that moment. This is why I, I pursue wealth. This is the highest sort of thing where I pursue wealth, is to fulfill God's commands in it. Now, yes, you know, becoming a doctor, helping you know, fellow human beings, you're not the Shafi. But you are like, in a sense, God, one of God's tools, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not, I just don't lose sleep over money, man. Because then you understand the true key to money. And if you want to increase your wealth, make a istighfar and improve your mindfulness in prayer. Most people are like, what does that have to do with making more money? It's because you have yaqeen, the promise of God. The promise is attached to iman and amal of salihat. So salah is a means to risk. Look at the Quran. 
وأمر أهلك بالصلاة واستبر عليها لا نسألك رزقا. A lot of times he mentions risk along with salah. وقلت استغفروا ربكم. What does istighfar have to do with يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا ويمددكم بأموال? He gives you money through istighfar. How are they related? God saying, well, put not everything is logical because not everything is just what you see. There's only so much within your consciousness. There's another world where things are operating that is not visible to you, that is closer to what is real than the visible world that you are in. So, you know yeah. what? It reminds me of what you're saying. Right? I think that was such a. When I heard it, I don't know why. When I heard it last week, it hit me differently. Because for Allah to make an adhan, Right, ta'adhana comes from the same root yeah. as adhan, like an announcement. Yeah, an yeah. announcement. Yeah, like it's basically a declaration, a call out. I swear, if you guys make shukr, if you guys give gratitude, I will give you more and more. And I thought, I was like, wow, subhanallah. And you know, what is the opposite of shukr? It's kufr, disbelief in Allah. Absolutely. And the one of the greatest manifestations of shukr is prayer, Mashallah. is worship. Mashallah. So I, and, and and to understand, like Allah says, "I'malu ala Dawood a shukra, wa qalilum min ibadi a shakur." At the same time, He links the action of shukur. So shukur can be of types, right? Like shukr al lisan, where you're thankful through your tongue. But Allah says, "I'malu ala Dawood a shukra, wa qalilum min ibadi a shakur." When when it comes to acting, like shukur through action, Allah says, "A few of my servants follow this." What is action? Th- what is shukur through action? Shukur of the eyes is not to look at haram. Shukur of the tongue is not to backbite. Shukur of the ears is not to listen to ghiba. This is the true abd and shakura, you know. But someone that is just alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. A lot of Muslims say alhamdulillah, but if you examine their lives, unfortunately, they're, they're on their journey, but there's a lot of work to do. So yeah, shukur is one of the highest, um, you know, spiritual type of uh, levels that one can attain. Um, and Allah describes uh, Sulaiman. He says, Ni'm al Abd. He's a very thankful servant. He says, What a great servant, always returning to God's command. Innahu awab. Then he describes Ayyub in the same way. Ni'm al Abd. Inna wajadnahu sabira. Ni'm al Abd. Innahu awab. Describes him the same way. What? They were both returning to what? To God's command in the situation. He was in a state of tribulation. Be patient. That's God's command. Don't complain to others. Complain to me. Talk to me. A lot of wealth, okay, now through shukr. Don't let the wealth distract you from me. Make sure it's halal, you know. These type of things fulfill God's command in it. You know, thank me also with your tongue. Don't disobey me with any of this wealth. Pay your zakah. Always returning to God's command. Now Allah says these are ni'm al They are the good servants. So as are you a servant of God or the servant of money? That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he says, Ta'isa Abdu Dirhami wa Dinar. He says that the, a loser is the servant or abd of gold and silver, of the monetary. So you you want it in your hands, not in your heart. It's okay to have in your pockets. We just want to remove it from people's hearts. Now, now you have a different relationship with money. Now go and attain all the money you want. It's not going to harm you. But understand, you need to be with money, like Imam Ghazali says, like a snake charmer. It's like, because it's poisonous. It's, but, but if you're a snake charmer, you can, you know, remove the harm, get the harm out of the way and take some good from it. But if you're not, you can easily get bitten and, and, and poisoned. So you have to be very careful when you're tiptoeing around money, most of the awliya, a lot of them, they're, they they just uh, they're like, we don't want that. Test. We don't we don't think we can pass that test possibly. Allahu Akbar. So how would we categorize this? Because I believe what we're speaking of is how to attain wealth by a spiritual means. Yes. I'm curious what your thought is. Absolutely. On if we can list it for someone, because this good. has been a very complex conversation. Yes. 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 So let I'm curious for you to. Give us a list, Brother Osama, of top five spiritual attributes one must have to attain. The first thing you need to do is, uh, first and foremost, is fix your intention. Why it is that your intention is what motivates you to do something. It's the motivating factor. 
So I'm after the money to fulfill God's commands, you know, as a slave, as a servant of God, whatever he wants from me, I'm not going to break any of the rules he associated with money. And I want to, one, avoid any haram. So the source of the rizq is halal. You know, that's a very important condition because for your du'as to be answered, you, you have to eat from a halal source. Otherwise, it, 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 all of this doesn't really matter. After you've ensured that, that it is halal that you, and that you have the right intention for seeking it, uh, the next step would be not to have any conviction on it. That it is not what's going to solve your problems. Allah can solve all your problems Allah operates in three ways. Write this down. For, with, through the means, without the means, and against the means. In all three, Allah is acting. But sometimes, most of the time, 99.999% of the time, He operates through the means. So through money. But He's the one operating. Money doesn't benefit or harm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. So you can't have conviction on the money itself. And you do that by negating money verbally at times and thinking and pondering about it. If I had a billion dollars and I'm trapped in a room, what's my billions gonna do me if I can't buy a cup of water or get some food? I'm gonna die, right? So is it really that helpful? Depends. Um, understanding that it's useful is very different than having conviction on it benefiting and harming. Allah made the sunnah of it that it, you can help other people with it. That's, a, that's okay. So we said, back to it, the right intention uh, in seeking it, that it's halal, um, that you don't have conviction on it, that you fulfill whatever rules are associated with it, um, and then finally to Meaning be, charity, giving giving back and giving charity? Yes. Or? Any rules. So what's associated with money? If you have it and it's of a certain amount for a certain amount of time, you have to pay zakah. But charity is optional. But yeah, it's recommended. So you should do it. You should. Allah will send you people that ask for help as a test at times. Say, so, well, I don't have enough. You know, the, the, the true believer is the one that has more conviction on what's in Allah's hands than what's in his own hands and pockets. That's a true believer. So you might have nothing, but Allah khalas, in his khaza'in, he has control. So it doesn't mean I can't give sadaqah. You don't have to give a million dollars. Like I, I have this habit I'll, I'll, as a, something I recommend as part of your daily routine. He says, how do we prioritize it? How do we go about wealth? This is all about understanding. But in terms of now I want to make some money, all right? Because I want, I have all the right intention now. What do I do? The first thing is your five times salah. If you're, you, you now understand that money can't benefit or harm, you know the rules associated with all that stuff, but now you have to, you know, go after it. Okay, what, what's the first thing? If you don't have salah in place, there's going to be no barakah. Like the chicken, you can feed it in two ways. You can spread all the chicken feed or you can put all the feed in one place. The chicken can have an easy time getting it or it can be all over the place. So barakah, so five times salah. And the more in the masjid and the more on time and the more mindful, the more powerful. I would even argue that it's one of the most powerful ways of ensuring easy risk in this life. Just making sure those five prayers are solid. Get them in. Make sure they're getting done. And then a certain regiment of daily istighfar. I'm actually giving you the tools now because most people are like, oh, uh, you know, uh, maybe sign up to Hustlers University and, and learn about the, the freelance course and this or, or sign up on this platform and learn. We'll get to those. But the first thing a believer always goes towards, Iman and Amal. So the real means, Salah, Istighfar, these are all, these are all Amal. Dua, Tahajjud. Once you have these in place, now okay, let me go about, I mean, I, I decided to study at Harvard University for a reason. It has a name. Can it really benefit or harm me? No, but it's a means that I take. It opens up, God willing, certain doors. And it's the path Allah put me towards or on. And alhamdulillah, but you don't find me on every, you know, like going around people, I, you know, I've got a Harvard degree. I've got a, I've got a Harvard degree. There are many people that are simpletons with Harvard degrees and vice versa. So... This aspect needs to be in place 
then putting the effort to learn the trade and prioritizing. Five times Salah is my calendar, in the masjid whenever I can, at least Fajr and Isha, a daily amount of Quran, a daily amount of dhikr, istighfar, your, your moment-to-moment prophetic adhkar, like leaving the house, waking up, going to sleep, making wudu, praying, going to the masjid, traveling, whatever it is, being with your husband or wife, learning all those, deploying them, being in a state of awareness, then you'll, you, things will just come to you, man. They, they will. It's like, uh, because it's God's matrix. Saying, okay, you fulfilled all the real means. Then Allah is like, it's easy, man. It's like, it just, everything just ma- falls into place. It's not magically or randomly. It's because you're on, you got God on your side. So this is how you balance between a perspective with a few bullet points, intention, yaqeen, the things that we mentioned, halal source, fulfilling God's commands, not distracting you from your other priorities, you know, charity, sada, all that stuff, helping others within your family, starting with your closest ones first, your wife, your children, your neighbors, and working your way out, your parents, all that. And then after the perspective is fixed, then the amilu salihat, you fixed amanu, now amilu salihat, salah, dhikr, prophetic sayings, the different uh, daily adhkar, all of that is in place, and very important, avoiding the haram. So there isn't like, you're doing all this good stuff, you're taking two steps forward and 17 back because of backbiting and ghiba and this. That's why it's part of my book, The Afterlife Manual. I have a section in the end called like the, the, the raqib challenges. They're like muraqaba, like you watch over yourself, you make sure there are certain sins you don't commit and you have to do a streak of 40 days where you don't break any of those things. Just like they have the 40 strong for your workout. You know, for 40 days, you won't eat junk. You'll do this. You'll work out for this many hours. The same, but spiritually, you take care of the soul aspect of you. Why the soul? Because it's God's command. What strengthens the soul? God's commands. Why? Because the soul is made from God's command. What strengthens the body? Water and food. Where does the body come from? Earth. Where does water and food come from? Earth. So you strengthen the ruh through God's commands to keep you focused and prioritizing God's command over everything else. And now, okay, you go about, okay, I need to learn something, graphic design, freelancing, drop shipping, whatever it is, I'm going to take a means, and tijara is better than labor. The Prophet said nine-tenths of, you know, rizq is in tijara. There's more barakah in it and more of a choice over your time versus having to go to your employer and ask for time off. Tijara you know, is like you're trade. You're, you're operating in business means rather yeah. than employment. Yeah. So for you, your podcast, if it brings in, if it's a means of sustenance, then it's a, a form of tijara. So you'd have to learn, for example, when I first, you know, this might shock, um, maybe some people are not ready for it, but you know, when you go into something like YouTube and you're earning through YouTube, the believer will be like, how am I making money? See, the, the one week in faith will be like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's halal, I'm Muslim, I'll just tell it, you know. But to go out of your way and inquire a bit, be like, well, is my content going to be shown on any inappropriate channels where Allah is going to ask me about it on the Day of Judgment? Then I don't want it. Yes, YouTube and Google now has a way to like filter this out. Some scholars are for it, some are not. That you have to do your own research on that. But I'm just saying at least having that awareness it's not like the minute there's this opportunity to make money, you're the slave of money, so you're running towards it. No, you're a yeah, slave of Yeah, I made sure my ad revenue, I made sure my ad revenue, none of my ad, the ads that come up on my videos are for alcohol or, or any of that stuff. So There you go. Yeah. There you go. But, but you, because you're conscious of, the, why are you conscious of that? Like what, what, what made you decide to look into that and worry about that? Because what you said, it, I learned it through direct experience i found when i was spending so much time editing and editing and, and, and what i thought was my best and finest work <laughs> and i left off to hajjud i left off weekly going out and handing money to the homeless i left off all the other good deeds that i was doing uh for the sake of editing and grinding and putting in the work it rendered useless and then when i did less work in order to give time for the spiritual 
I found that less work, even though in my mind, I was like, this isn't as good doing much, but hundreds of thousands of views or whatever, doing much better. So that I literally was reminded myself of sort of an I was like, this is literally it. I'm wasting my time by putting in more effort into the worldly life than yeah. the spiritual. And what did Allah show you? Allah showed you basically, it, let's take that, your very clear example that you gave, that you're not the true manager of your affairs. Like you're like, when I put in the effort and I had no time, it's like nothing is seemed to work out as well. And then when I started putting more, you didn't say you stopped working. You just, you didn't neglect those, those priorities, like your five times daily prayer. That's the real test, you know. You're ready to drop everything for salah. And that's why Allah begins how many takbirat before the shahada in the adhan? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right, that's two. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That's four. Oh, four. Ashhadu an la, right? So the shahada comes after four takbirs. Because Allah is telling you, whatever you're busy with, He knows. I'm Akbar. I'm greater than that. You drop that right now. And he realizes, like, like you, it's like you need a wake-up call. You need to be slapped. Allahu Akbar is like, Allah, okay. And it's just like, okay, a little bit of a, no, give him another jolt, another jolt. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then you're like, oh, okay. But the one who's deaf, because the heart is dead, it's not reflecting that nur. It's like yeah, you neglect it completely. It's like sometimes, you know, you're around people, they can't hear the word of God. It makes them very uncomfortable. People yes. To, yeah, you've, you've noticed that. It's so, weird. Yeah, it is. It's trippy. <laughs> like you're sitting with them and you're like, you're actually getting really upset right now over something that's not upsettable. At. You can't, I, I don't even think upsettable is a word, but yeah. you can't even get upset about this. But they are. They, I, I want to ask you this, Brother Osama. So there's some people that are maybe listening to us and they're in their 30s, 40s, and Allah may have not given them the riz. Or, or obviously Allah has given them riz, but what may not have been what they expected or wanted, they're not as rich as their fellow Muslims, and they're sitting there going, I pray, I do tahajjud, I give in money, and they, they also remind themselves of, of the hadith where a man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that was poor, and asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make me rich, and the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, I can, I can make this dua, but I advise you, if you'd like to take my advice, that you should remain in the state that you are and be patient, and that is better for you. And the man didn't take the Prophet, peace be upon him,'s advice and said, no, ask Allah to make me rich, please. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, made the dua, the man surely became rich and millionaire, and they said they never saw him at the masjid again, and some, some sources say that later he returned. And some sources even say that he left Islam. So how do we balance that idea of, at the end of the day, some people aren't meant to be rich and it's better for them not to be rich or have the money and have the sustenance. Well, actually, everyone has sustenance, but have the, the money. And also this idea that we've been talking about so far. Well, the Prophet ﷺ also told us to focus our attention on those that are less fortunate than us for that reason. Because he knows this is the, um, the inclination, the natural inclination of the human being is that to compare uh, themselves. So naturally, you're going to look at the one that has the thing that you don't have, yeah, and, and you're going to wish for that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, keep your gaze at those that are less fortunate than you, and then that is more... Um, uh, that will help you be grateful, right? And then um, for those um, that have a lot, um, they it, it's just a, another taxonomy, a way to like view it. So this is important to kind of like establish, but it's hard because we live in the time of social media and, and it's everywhere, like, so I can't help it. So the first thing is to realize that Allah has, knows best and has, he's fair and just and everybody gets a certain, you know, like tests from Allah. But if you were to take the whole picture and compare it, it there's justice there and how he tests someone versus how he tests you. The overall, holistically, the test is sort of equal in difficulty, holistically, overall, whereas some parts may be more difficult for one than the other. Understanding that and understanding that this is the part. See, Qadar, there's, there's that which is from God to you. 
that you have no control over whatsoever. Did you choose to be born to an Egyptian Muslim family? Was that something you applied for in the world of souls? You know, that, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, decreed for you. You know, I, did, I didn't request it. So there are things from God to you that I have no control over. For those, there's taslim. I submit and rida. Allah, you know what's best for me. This is very important, right? And there are things from Allah in you. Are you controlling your heartbeat right now, your liver function, kidney function? Those are out of God's mercy, he's running the show there as well. Like he's running everything. And then there's what's from you to God. So those are the various, you know, I shared with you the example of the black mirror in that movie where you make a choice. It's like all the different scenarios are written out by God, but then he, the movie pauses and it's like you have to make a decision. And based on the decision you make, a different book is sort of comes to life. And a new sort of kitab, based on the choice you made. If you made a good choice, you would open this book of destiny with all these good things happening. If you make the wrong choice, you're going to open that book of destiny with all the... This is why Allah calls it Ummul Kitab as well. The mother of books, like it gives birth to other books. يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ كِتَابٍ for every, for every ajal, there's a book. Wait, there's more than one book? Yeah, Allah talks about Ummul Kitab. And then he talks about the books of destiny and Kitab and Kutub. And it, it, it's a secret within the Quran that you have to delve into. And having the language and the knowledge helps there. But for those that don't have that, just understanding the, the basic mechanisms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you and present you with a scenario where you have to choose. That's your sole focus and purpose. You're missing out. You're failing the test because you're so worried about what's God going to test me and how come I don't have this and I have... You're all up in your head while life is passing you by and you're missing all these opportunities to, to practice dhikr, which is obedience, which is prophetic guidance, which is what the prophet would have done in that same exact situation. He outlined his life completely for you to follow and called it guidance. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that, that that helps. I'm not, I'm not someone, listen, per, pursue your dreams, but make your ultimate dream, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, paradise and the hereafter. And understand that dunya is a function of the hereafter. We can't leave the asbab, we can't not work. The world wouldn't function, like everybody's gonna get out and work. Just do it in a way where you're a servant of God and not a servant of, of the dinero. So just, yeah. So, okay. Brother Sam, take, grab a drink real quick. <laughs> you know. Chill out, yeah. No, it just some people, I, I see them in their, in their zone, and I'm like, they need a drink. <laughs> they need to drink some water. I also want to be a good host, too. You know, don't want to have you working the whole time. <laughs> No, mashallah, uh, you're, you, the points you make are, are so dead on and you've given me a few things to uh, think about as well from the things you, that you shared as well, mashallah. Uh, alhamdulillah, I'm glad I could even do that for someone like you, mashallah. No. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan right now, I'm not going to lie. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> I, I, I actually, I, like, it's not even, I found you organically. Like, oh, you really? came up on my mm. feed. Okay. And one of your videos where you were talking to, if you're an influencer, which I don't think I'm an influencer, but you also said if you're a content creator, renew your intentions, make Ooh. sure your intentions are this. This actually, it, it's a, I, and I, I thought to myself in that moment, subhanAllah, this is what I needed. And Allah brought it to my timeline in that moment. And then as I was thinking, I would really like for this guy to come on my podcast. <laughs> I get a message from a random viewer of the podcast that goes, you should have Brother Osama from the Muslim Hub Club on. So I was like, I literally responded. I was like, that's crazy. You just said that. I was just thinking this. So that's when I messaged you. Because we don't want to, you don't have time to waste. So why waste? Like Allah says in the Quran, Man jaa bil hasana. You have to bring your hasana with you. Just doing it doesn't mean it'll show up because you can spoil the act in the process before it gets to God. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about 
Do you know who the broke person is? Look at the Prophet Look, you see, if there's so much to unpack from this hadith. Like, do you know who the one who's like financially broke, almost like muflis? And the, and the Sahaba were like, Man la dirhama wa la dinara lahu. The one without any gold or silver? Like, who would be the, the, the Prophet No, no, no. The muflis, the, the one who's broke, is the one that on the day of judgment shows up with mountains of actions. You know, but, but he, you know, he did not fulfill the rights of this individual and broke this law and this. And so he owes people. So on the day of judgment, those people will come forth and they'll begin to take from his good deeds until they're, you know, you fulfilled their rights. Because if you don't fulfill it here, it has to be fulfilled there. That's why a lot, that's why it's called judgment day. It has to be justice. Where mm -hmm. all the wrongs are, are righted, so to speak. I don't know if that works. Uh, rights are wrong. So, so Brother um, Sam, yeah. so who, who does Allah love more? The, the believer that is the rich believer or the poor believer? Allah. The, uh, Allah loves the awab. See, see, that's the thing. You, I, I would love that you asked that question because, again, it's like we're money is almost still like the end cause. We have to like unscrew it, kind of like loosen it up. It's like, so who does Allah love more? Is it the one with money or without money? Is it the rich believer or the poor believer? But again, if you go back to the verse, it says, "Wa li Sulaiman, ni'mal abd innahu awab." Always returning to God's command. So the answer is neither. The most beloved to Allah is based on how you deal. So the one without money can be more beloved than the rich person. And the rich one can be more beloved to Allah than the poor person. What's, what's, the, what's the, 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 the thing we test by? The taqwa. So what makes the one with, with no money more muttaqi? Is that they they hold their urge to to do wrong and to commit haram, and the other person as well. They also have to, you know. It's also a big test when you have all the means. That's why I would say, you know what, a young person with a lot of money. I would say it, 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 this would be my guess. I could be wrong, and I often am. Is more beloved to Allah because. The young person has the capacity to disobey Allah. He has his health or she has her health and the wealth as well. But then they refrain. That's a big deal for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? Yeah, so it's the rich one who's, who's gra grateful and the poor one who's patient. Yes. So the, the real litmus test, the real uh, uh, sign of success is the one who returns to God's command in both of them more than the other, therefore more taqwa. However, overall, if I were to bet on one and I could only choose one, I would say the rich one that is, that you know is holding off. I want to actually, let's let's look at this video together by Sheikh Sharawi. Ooh, he says giant. <laughs> have you watched, um, they did a, uh, his life story. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've uh, heard of it. Beautiful. I heard of it. Yeah, I can't say I watched the whole thing, but I think I caught some uh, glimpses of it. Oh, it, it, it's beautiful, man. His tafsir of the Qur'an is uh, next level. And his tafsir, the strength of his tafsir is in the strength of his command of the Arabic language. Notice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and that's why I'm learning Arabic uh, right now. It's very important. Even the likes of, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, for example, from Zaytuna. If you notice in a lot of his yeah. uh, da'wah and a lot of his talks, He's always breaking down the, the the roots of words, right? And he's always explaining the meanings, and the, so it, it really gives a, a solid grasp uh, in terms of your understanding when the language is uh, intact. How do how do you? Who's one of your favorite scholars right now? Out. Ooh, um, there a lot of them are doing great work, man. Subhanallah, like everybody in his own way. I. I wouldn't say I was one to watch um, a lot of scholars. Like my circle of scholars is hidden because they're not the type that 
do social media work. The types that I like study with in like Medina and Mecca, and they're not the types that are like, they're more hidden underground, not in a bad way, like they have something to hide, but they're just not for the cameras. Not that they're necessarily, well, to some degree, they, they have their, their take is that online da'wah, it definitely has its place, but your own self-rectification has to do with your own struggle. So you can't solely depend on sitting on a desk, spreading the da'wah online. You have to move yourself for the sake of the deen. But in terms of the message and the reach, yes, other people can benefit. But what's the use if everybody benefits from the talk, your talks except you? <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> that's yeah. a disaster yeah. right yeah. so no, intent going back to intention remember before you play that video mm -hmm. you mentioned i said before you do anything because we we don't have time to waste it's like i spend all these hours creating content and it's not accepted by allah because allah says Man jaa bil hasana. so i have to protect the deed by hiding it and not showing off and you know just almost forgetting about it Versus like rubbing it in someone's face when they let me down. Remember that day when I helped you out? Is this what I deserve? Don't you know put mm -hmm. out your good deeds with right, men and other. It's like making someone, it's like, if it wasn't for me, where would you be sort of thing. Astaghfirullah. So you have to yeah. be mindful of these things. So can you share my, can you see my screen go. right now? Yeah, I got it. Beautiful. <laughs> قال حديث القدسي يحب سلاسا ايه؟ وحبي لسلاسا اشد. طب ايه الثلاثه اللي بيحبهم ويحب الثلاثه اشد؟ قال احب الفقير المتواضع والغني المتواضع اشد. الله ما شاء الله. واحب الشيخ الطائع والشاب الطائع اشد. Allah. <laughs> وأبغض الفقير البخيل والغني البخيل so I, I think that was uh, it reminded me of what we were talking about and I love I love that hadith how powerful wow you gave me goosebumps man subhanallah so beautiful like it's so simple the more so, so simple but what do you learn from that it's the more um, there's more mujahada and وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا the, Those that strive, fina in my commands. So you notice in each of those, I, I love the, um, you know, the, 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 the الشيخ الطائع, but I love the شاب الطائع more. So I love the, you know, sheikh, the older man who is obedient, but the younger, why? Because it's tougher for the younger to obey. So there's more of a struggle on the nafs. That seems to be the, you know, the key to opening this. So, yeah, so it looks like I, I got lucky on that one and I chose the right one. But <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate yeah, exactly. you sharing that. But I love the six, all six of them that he mentioned. Please do share that link with me. I, I really like that video, mashallah. It's a very good reminder. I, I watch it, and alhamdulillah, as much as I can if I need it. Uh, question for you. If... Outside of the pro meeting the Prophet, peace be upon him, and messengers of God, if Allah grants you by his mercy amin, to enter heaven, what, what is one thing you would like to do? Uh, in heaven? Yes. Itself? If I would <laughs> just sit with the Prophet. Yeah, it's a dream of mine. I told you you can't pick that one. Oh, you did? You, you said I can't pick the pro. Okay, okay, okay. You can't okay. pick that because that one's an obvious one. I mean, yeah. there, there's nobody. So there's I, did, no I didn't grasp that. that, that. My apologies. Yeah, yeah. I that because that's something really. I mean, for me, is a is a big one. Um, obviously, seeing Allah and these things because we know it's a possibility there. Um, 
what's something that I really, part of it, I really think this thing, just watching the movie of life is a big, like for me, it's just fascinating. I want to see it all unfold before me, even if that took, there's no time in paradise, so it doesn't matter, but I'd love to see that. Um, beyond that, I would say, I'm looking forward to flying, bro. Like for me, I've always been into Superman as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna just find me like you know, even like if you look when i did the logo for muslim hub like the mh you know it's always like put me as well it's like oh he was like my favorite sort of superhero as a, as a child so and then until i realized that yeah we, we can have superpowers but not of that type of nature uh different types of spiritual powers um but yeah you'd probably find me uh more there and i think what every man is going to be to some degree busy with <laughs> without getting into it because it's very inappropriate <laughs> but you know it's like um your wife is going to be the prettiest of all the so uh that's that's going to be also fun not that we don't love them the way they are now but um of course of yeah course. so you might you might not find me for a few deca decathons <laughs> or <whatever. laughs> where's brother Osao? he's still busy he needs a few more uh, centuries there but yeah I'd say, uh, oh my god a few centuries what would you i'm curious what, where, where, where do i find you man <laughs> so i i one thing i would love to do is uh, ask Allah to show me how he creates universes, similar to basically synonymous with the story of life. But I want to see the, the story of the universe. And I want to ask him because it's a question that we can't answer, which is why. Why all of this? Hmm. And Allah tells us in the Quran, it's def these are the reasons that are definitely not it. For example, we did not create the universe and, you got, and humanity and life for play mm. if we wanted for entertainment we would have found it within ourselves so Allah gives us what it's not but i would love to know why what really why mm. uh that's a question that that has been on my mind um also another one is when uh in the quran وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ أَزَرَ أَتَتَّخِذُ أَصْنَامًا آلِهَا uh and actually i'm gonna skip the the first part but then Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And I'm always like, what, 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 is, what is that? What is it, the Malakuta السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ? What did Prophet Ibrahim get to see? So and very specific questions, and then it's almost like, show me this scenario, show me this scenario. How did you teach Ibrahim this? What, when Musa said, show me yourself, show me what, like, when you, you know, told him to look at that mountain and... So yeah, I would say that can probably be all covered by just saying, Allah, show me the movie of life, but I would add, and I'd like uh, behind the scenes access. <laughs> so the scenes, yeah. show, me, show me the behind the scenes stuff as well, right? That, because that there's, a, there's an implication in, or an inference. No, there's an implication in the Quran of spiritual superpowers. You mentioned that you like superheroes and stuff like that. There's an implication in the Quran, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's mm. spiritual su that you can get superpowers based off of spiritual a certain spiritual level. And where I get this evidence from is from when Prophet Sulaiman asks his cabinet to mm. bring the throne of the Queen of Sheba. And one Ifrit, Ifrit or, or one of the stronger jinns, types of forms of jinn, says, I can bring it to you before you get up from your ch throne. And then, رَجُلٌ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ قَالَ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْكَ تَرْفُقُ Right? I think yeah, that's before the, you blink an eye. Before you blink an eye. What ilm, what ilm from the book, what knowledge from the book was he able to attain yeah. that allowed him this superpower of being able to travel hundreds or thousands of miles in a blink of an eye? SubhanAllah. That is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. what is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. These, uh, subhanAllah, those, those those secrets. And as you find scholars still debating, you know, whether qala ifritum min al jinni, you know, and who was this person with the uh, ilmu min al kitab? Some will say khidr, some will say prophet, some will say it's a righteous man. Who, who is it that had those secrets? Sulaiman was, alayhi salam, his uh, reign and his air was fascinating. 
that's right that and a lot and this of this actually the, leads me to my next question but go ahead go ahead no no i was just saying like all the culture the you know aladdin and the magic lamp and the ring and solomon and the carpet those where where do they get all that stuff from right so these yeah. are the stories yeah yeah if you were to go back in time in any time period besides the prophet peace be upon him musa Lisa. musa yeah i just see he's one why of is that I think there's a hikmah, first of all, for why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his story is the most mentioned in the Qur'an. I believe that it's almost like a guidance for our ummah. It, it's not a coincidence that the majority of stories in the Qur'an are that of prophets. I believe it's because of the khatam in nubuwa because the Prophet ﷺ is the final messenger, and that that responsibility was given to kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linas, that we were given this responsibility, that Allah outlined the stories of the prophets to show us how to go about, you know, living our lives as, as messengers of the messenger. We're not messengers of God. We're messengers of the messenger of God. The Sahaba used to say, "Inni Rasulullahi, Rasulu Rasulillahi ilaykum." I'm the pro I'm the messenger of the messenger of God sent to you. You know, the, feeling this responsibility, and that a lot of the um, the the story of Musa is detailed because there's a lot to take from it. The same difficulties, tribulations, fitness that Bani Israel went through, we're going through. And, and so I just find that time fascinating, whether it was, can imagine Musa was Kalimullah. He spoke to God. Whatever that means, I don't want to get into the Aqidah aspect of it, but like, it's just awesome. You know, he was speaking to God and his staff and being in front of Fir'aun. Like it, it wasn't like sometimes you read the Quran, your mind might like downplay it to this like small court of he was like king of the earth at the time. It's just like the mulk was next level. So to stand in front of him and give him da'wah was no easy task. And how Allah prepares him with the story to adjust his, his yaqeen to be solid through the staff. That don't get caught up in the outer forms of things. I'm the one behind the scene controlling anything, be it benefit you see coming from a staff or harm coming from a snake. I'm the one really controlling all this phenomena. And to build that yaqeen and then say, go to Fir'aun and, and give him that mess. I just find that era, the Dead Sea, the, the pyramids and how it's all linked. And because and, right now still, like even on Joe Rogan, he's often, he's very fascinated with the pyramids and you'll often find him saying, till this moment, they haven't figured out how they built the pyramids. Like there's no way the size of those stones and the structure only for a scholar recently to come up and say, actually, the Quran does give the answer. Um, that it wasn't that the, they were these rocks were necessarily dragged a piece at a time, that they were some type of clean, some type of earthly material that was heated and then divided up in that way. So there was a system and a mechanism where the pyramids were built. But what, were, 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 was he referring to the pyramids there or something else? So for me, that's the period uh, that I'm really fascinated with. Where would you go? Would you be able to, and maybe not, would you be able to elaborate a little bit on, I'm, I'm really fascinated, as an Egyptian, I'm very fascinated <laughs> about pyramid engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, and can you elaborate li, a little bit more? If you could look up that, I can actually really quick. Um, yeah, an awkward liya hamana. Haman is someone that uh, I would love to have a whole podcast on one day. He was, yeah, he held uh, the secrets. He knew, like he he knew the bottom line with Pharaoh that Pharaoh was not a god. Like he knew the behind the scenes sort of. Thing. I think one time he walked in on him and. He said something to the effect that I'm busy creating this or doing that. And like Haman was like, in, in Egyptian, this would sound something like Alameen. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's almost like, <laughs> you're trying to fool me or Pharaoh. Like, I, we know, <laughs> like Egyptians would say, we buried it together, which means like, we know each other's inner like uh, secrets. Don't Don't play that game with me creating yeah. this and that but but he really you know he played that role really well um but the verse he was itself deluded into thinking it yeah subhanallah see and you know can... you can get to the the nafs can get to a point and that's why the pharaoh is is the worst human being to ever live 
your soul or not, your nefs can get to a point where it could be deluded into thinking something like it's God sure. or it is the manifester or master. Because what you the said, verse, by the way, just so I don't this. lose track of it, the verse is وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ. It's in Surah Al-Qasas, um, verse uh, uh, thirty-eight. It says وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأُ مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرِ فَأَوْقِدْ لِي يَا هَامَانُ عَلَى الطِّينِ فَجْعَلْ لِي صَرْحًا لَعَلِّي أَطَّلِعُ إِلَى إِلَهِ مُوسَى وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّهُ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ It's talking about a sarh, a type of some tool of sorts. Could it be the pyramids that he built for him and how he built them? So I would say take this verse, Google it, and you'll find a... Not too many, I think a couple of scholars recently, but you'll find it on YouTube. I, I, I'll try to find it and send you the link, inshallah, where they talk okay. about the possibilities of what this uh, verse is alluding to when it comes to the pyramids. But, he's talking about using fire and mud to sort of, you know, turn turn these, these uh, th that, that structure. It's almost like they built it all and then kind of like, added the flame and then it became erect rather than coming up with this concept that they actually had to carry these massive rocks that weighed tons and tons all the way up and in such a perfect obviously it makes no sense but if you're th to think about it as clean mud that is kind of like like a lego kind of all putting each other and they're able to like you know that if, you know that that thing when people are you know making concrete or whatever it is that they clean up the con the 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 what is it the cement sorry that you know the 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 different rocks they're making the 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 stones you know utilizing the different cement and they're putting it in blocks so it's almost like they had this container so to speak filled it added heat and were able to build it this is a theory and we don't know if it's a fact but some scholars had had talked about it and I found it fascinating interesting okay okay yeah. Well, yeah, no, alam. But yeah, I, I hope that takes care of some of the questions. I, I think if, if, if I can just uh, end maybe with some general advice sure, it, sure. is that we all have, you know, this is, I often say this, is, we're not playing PlayStation. Dunya is mentioned as live and a game, but it's a very serious game. We don't have multiple lives. We have one life. And we're here to kind of figure it out. And Islam and the Quran are very clear about every single aspect of how, what your purpose is, what you need to believe, how to like, you know, um, uh, play out in, you know, how to run your life in a, so not run your life, but how to act in your life in a certain way that gives you success in here and the hereafter. To be more interested in applying whatever we learn rather than just you know, um, yeah, learning it all and it's fascinating because it's held against us if we don't put it into practice. Uh, it's a mas'uliyah and responsibility and to do a little and to take it easy, and you know, keep the, the, the it's a long, long sort of haul journey that you have to take, but to really work on the basics like yaqeen and iman and salah and having it in place and then just watch. Allah is very generous. He's not asking for a lot. Most of what is offered to you in this world is halal. The haram, the what is forbidden, is actually very, very, very small proportion of the pie or portion of the pie. So to focus on that, busy yourself with yourself, not with the faults of others, but give others always the benefit of the doubt and just busy yourself working on your iman, working on your amal, and you will see, it's just life will, subhanAllah, Allah will play it out in such a way for you where inshallah you'll find his gnosis and ma'rifah and you'll get to know him better. Uh, and inshallah, he will show you and guide you the ways to success. And this is not to just Muslims, but the, the, the message of the Qur'an is, is extremely clear. It's just beautiful, this Qur'an. So for anybody like that has the opportunity to really study it and, and get into it, everything is in the Qur'an. So it's, and not to be little hadith in any way, because some people are like, oh, we are, we're all about Qur'an, and some people, no. The, the, both are, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad explains a lot of what is in the Qur'an through his lifestyle and his actions and whatnot. 
and to live a balanced lifestyle. You don't need to be anxious. Just live out God's you know, divine matrix in a way that's pleasing to him. Do your best. And then you have repentance and istighfar as a tool all along the way. No matter how many times you mess up, the doors are always open, inshallah, to tawbah and to repentance. That is key more than all the, I know this talk is very, you know, the matrix and the world and deeds. And it's important to, it's a new way of breaking it down that makes it digestible to some. But really just be very interested in applying what you learn, even if it's little. Inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Brother Usama Sharafa, can you tell... Uh, do you have anything to plug for us? No, the Muslim, no, this, oh, the that, Muslim yeah. founder of the Muslim Hub Club? I, <laughs> <laughs> My wife just was just, you never, you forgot to mention your book. And then, yeah, I often do. Um, yeah, I, I recently, I have Muslim Hub, which was originally, I, I started it just as a place to kind of gather Muslims that are interested, specifically for Muslims. That was my initial intention, that wanted to, you know, get this new perspective of the deen and really just really get it and have a way to proper perspective of life and a proper way to respond to life, but to understand it in these simple terms to some degree. So what is it? Is it a website? Is it a seminar? Muslimhub.club is a website, but I have a Patreon community. So um, it's a small community for those that are more serious. Uh, that's uh, patreon.com forward slash muslimhub. And then muslimhub.club is the website. And you can find my book, uh, called the Afterlife Manual: Every Muslim's Guide to Happily Ever Hereafter. This is it's, it's on Amazon, and it, you can also buy it as a PDF off my website. Okay, but inshallah, everyone should should go check it out. I know I will myself, uh, brother brother Osama. Uh, j just brother to get Rahman. for anyone who doesn't know, he he's a uh, he's a biomedical and electrical engineering. He got a bachelor for it, in his undergrad, and he's got a master's. Uh, from Harvard University and has worked with uh, some of the most esteemed companies uh, across the world. Uh, Brother Osama, thank you so much for, for, for coming on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed your time here. Yeah, we, I know sure. I had a great time with you. I'm so glad you reached out because, you know, a lot of people tend to, you know, they feel they hold back. I'm so happy you reached out and it's an honor to be on your podcast. May Allah put barakah in it for you. And just always remember, man, rectify that intention. is Intention is not a one-time thing. It's a daily battle. So it's day to day. Every time you want to make a decision, rectify that intention. Shaitan, it's one of his main focus. It, 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 his, his main is just ruin. If I can't ru stop him from the act, mess up his intention. So always work on mm. that. And that's a reminder for myself more than anybody else. Allah as my witness. And thank you, man. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Inshallah, next time we meet, you have a few million followers and you didn't even do anything to get there. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you as well. You as well. I mean, I mean, I mean. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. This is the Ansari Podcast.